Hello and welcome to ABA Made Easy. I'm Mauricio and today we'll be covering the third section of the RBT exam. C. Skill Acquisition. This section is going to be a little long because it's the bulk of the exam. So I'm going to do two parts for skill acquisition. So this is the first part. So let's hop into it. C1. Identify the essential components of a written skill acquisition plan. So the first thing you want to do with a skill acquisition plan is choose a skill to target. The important thing is that this skill must be socially significant. What does that mean? It means that it helps the individual become more independent, it's age appropriate, and it must be socially relevant to increase their quality of life in a daily basis. Next thing is that you have to describe the skill and also describe what mastery or proficiency of the skill looks like. Then you have to choose the data collection procedures. This includes what materials will be used, what type of prompting will be used. Prompting is basically like hints that you'll give. How you will reinforce and what the plan is for maintenance after that skill has been mastered. After you've completed drafting the plan, the next step is to take baseline data. Baseline data is basically any data taken before an intervention occurs. And this is to know what the level of the child is before you even start the plan. During collection of baseline data, it's important not to reinforce or try to punish any of the behaviors. You're not manipulating, you're just seeing where they are. Okay, C2. Prepare for the session as required by the skill acquisition plan. So we kind of talked about this in a previous video. What do you need to be prepared? Do you remember? So before the session, you have to look over the data sheets to see what you are targeting this session and you choose the skills that you will focus on. So if you have some behaviors that are risky or dangerous, those will take priority. Also, be familiar with any procedures you have to implement and have all your materials ready. So this includes having all your devices charged, your flashcards ready, your reinforcers in hand, and other devices. One key thing to remember about behavior analysis is that it is data driven, which means that if the skill acquisition plan is not working, you must modify it. It is never set in stone. C3, use contingencies of reinforcement. So if you haven't watched it already, highly recommend you watch the reinforcement slash punishment video I made. I'll link it up here and in the description. Um, it goes into depth into what you should know about reinforcement. And this is one of the key concepts you have to understand in ABA. But just really quickly, reinforcement is a stimulus that is presented after a behavior occurs, which makes the behavior more likely to occur in the future. So let me ask you a question. If you give a child ice cream after he cleans his room, is the ice cream considered a reinforcer? The answer is, we don't know. Because a reinforcer is only a reinforcer after it's proven to increase the chances of that behavior occurring in the future. So at that point, we don't know if it's a reinforcer. If the child starts cleaning his room more often after getting ice cream, then it is a reinforcer. If instead, the child is less likely to clean his room after getting ice cream, it's actually a punisher and not a reinforcer. Same stimulus, different effects. Another important thing when using reinforcement is the immediacy or how long after the behavior occurs you present the reinforcer. This is important because the effectiveness of a reinforcer drops dramatically the longer you wait to give it. So you're supposed to give it immediately after the behavior occurs. Now let's talk about conditioned versus unconditioned reinforcement. Conditioning or condition simply means learned. 
So unconditioned reinforcement, also known as primary reinforcement, does not have to be learned. It's kind of primal, those inherent forms of reinforcement. So this could be like food, water, or sex. Conditioned reinforcement, also known as secondary reinforcement, is something that starts as a neutral stimulus that has no effect, and it's paired with an established reinforcer, and then it becomes a reinforcer itself. So the example that's always used is the bell with Pavlov's dog. A bell doesn't do anything to a dog, but when you pair a bell with something like food, now the bell can elicit a response like salivation. Next, we're going to talk about schedules of reinforcement. I highly recommend if you want an in-depth explanation of the schedules of reinforcement that you watch my other video I made on it. I'm not going to go over all that or else this video would be over 30 minutes long. But in that video, I talk about what to look for in graphs and then give examples of each one. But the key thing you have to remember is that there's two types of schedules of reinforcement. There's continuous and intermittent. Continuous reinforcement, or CR, is when you reinforce after every single instance of a behavior. Okay? So they engage in a behavior, boom, reinforcement. Another behavior, boom, reinforcement. Continuous reinforcement, CR. But in real life, you don't get reinforced after every single instance of a behavior. You get reinforced from time to time. And that's why we use intermittent reinforcement. So for intermittent reinforcement, there's four types. Fixed ratio, variable ratio, fixed interval, and variable interval. And those can also be abbreviated into FR, VR, FI, and VI. So let's break it down. Fixed means fixed or not changing. Variable means it changes from time to time. Ratio means you need a certain amount of responses to get a reinforcer. And interval means a certain amount of time has to pass before that reinforcement is available again. So it kind of has to charge up. You have to wait a minute or something like that for another availability of that reinforcer. So let's start with fixed ratio or FR. That means you need a specific amount of responses in order to get a reinforcer. So if they put FR3, that means it's fixed ratio three responses. So you need to respond three times correctly in order to get a reinforcer. So if a button is set up to be FR3, you have to push the button three times for the candy to come out. Variable ratio is like fixed ratio, except it varies from time to time. So it's not always going to be three. So let's say it's VR3. That three is actually just an average of the responses needed. So variable ratio three responses is, let's say you have a button and sometimes you press it two times, candy comes out. Sometimes you press it four times for candy to come out. And sometimes you press it three times and the candy comes out. So an average of all those times is three. So that's variable ratio three. And actually, this is the one that is least prone to extinction, which means that people will engage in this behavior the strongest and it's hard to make them stop. And that could lead to addiction sometimes. For example, with slot machines in Las Vegas, is the, is the example that they use all the time. They use a variable ratio schedule because they're, you're going to keep engaging in the behavior, hoping that you're going to hit that jackpot. But you don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but it's an average of time before you get that jackpot. Fixed interval, or FI, is when you have to wait for a certain amount of time to elapse before that reinforcement is available again. So with a button example, you press the button once and the candy comes out. You try to press it again, it's not working, it's not working, and then two minutes later you press it and then another candy comes out. So you know that every two minutes you can press it and candy will come out. So that is an FI2. So FI2 minutes because it takes two minutes 
for it to kind of recharge for you to be able to get candy again. Then you have variable interval, which is like fixed interval, except that it's variable. So it might not be two minutes every time. It might be one minute one time, three minutes another time, two minutes another time, but it averages two minutes. So that would be a VI2, variable interval two minutes. All right, C4, implement discrete trial training procedures. So discrete trial training, also known as discrete trial teaching or DTT, is a subset of ABA therapy which breaks down skills into smaller or discrete steps and it's usually done at a table. This is what most people imagine when you tell them that you're about to do an ABA session. It became popular after a 1987 Lovas paper published that showed that DTT is very effective for kids with autism. So in DTT, you have trials. And the trials are like this. You present the discriminative stimulus, or SD, and that's usually just an instruction, okay? Then they either do the correct response and you reinforce, or they have an incorrect response and then you prompt the correct response and that's basically it in a nutshell and then you just go on to the next trial so let's talk about some techniques used in DTT so the first thing you should know is mass trial mass trial is when you present the same instruction or SD over and over again this should be reserved for people who are very new to ABA or for learners that need the extra help and it should only be used for skills that will increase their independence like language or self-help skills. You could have a mass trial without distractors like for example you can say touch car and only have a flash card of one car on the table and nothing else on the table. That would be a mass trial without distractor and when people refer to something as a mass trial they're usually referring to it without distractors. However, mass trials could also be with distractors. And in that case, you refer to it as a distractor trial. So a distractor trial presents the same SD or instruction over and over, like touch car, but there's other things in the array on the table that serve as distractors that the child or learner does not know yet. So if you say touch car, you'd have the car which you're working on and then you have a helicopter and an airplane which they've never seen in their lives also on the table. Mixed trials are the opposite of mass trials. It's when you switch up the SD or instruction every single time. This is good so that the child can learn to discriminate between the different SDs or instructions. So an example of this is random rotation. Random rotation is when you have something you're working on, but also other objects on a table that they have already mastered. So in this example, you're working on touch car, but they already know plane and helicopter. So a session with random rotation could be like touch car, point to plane, cover helicopter, and that is random rotation. Once a learner masters a skill, it is important that they maintain the ability to engage in that skill. So you have to test it out from time to time after they've already mastered it. This is called maintenance. And one way to do maintenance is to throw in that flashcard or whatever they learned into random rotation. Some skills can also be generalized. And this is called generalization. That's basically that they're using that skill and applying it to different settings, times, or with different people. So for example, if you teach a child to draw with a crayon, they could generalize that skill in order to hold a pencil for writing. C5, implement naturalistic teaching procedures. So like I said earlier, not all ABA is done at the table, like with discrete trial training. 
If you have quality therapy, you should be doing it in a natural environment. So that's called naturalistic teaching or natural environment training or NET, which is basically when you take the skills you learned at the table and try to use them out there in the real world. And this is crucial to have in a quality therapy session because what's the point of teaching a child to label dog on a flashcard if they can't identify a dog at the park? It also provides spontaneous opportunities for learning. So if you see a squirrel, you could practice saying squirrel or labeling a squirrel or asking what a squirrel eats. So you have spontaneous opportunities for learning. So as a behavioral therapist, you might be required to go to the grocery store with a child or the mall or the park or even school. Wherever the problem behaviors or skill acquisition skills are needed, that's where you'll go. And it's really fun because there's no better feeling in the world than hanging out with the kiddos on a trampoline and jumping around and knowing that they are developing new skills that will help them progress. All you have to know for this section is that the skills learned in discrete trial training are to be generalized during natural environment training and that in naturalistic teaching there are spontaneous opportunities for learning. That's all you need to know. C6. Implement task analyze chaining procedures. Now I know I've been plugging a bunch of videos and I didn't want this video to get too long, but there's another video here that describes everything you need to know about chaining, but I'm just going to give you the quick rundown. So chaining is for teaching very complex tasks with many steps. So the first thing you need to do is a task analysis. And what that is, is that you get this complex task and split it up into very manageable small steps or chunks. After you're done with the task analysis, then you have to choose a, one of three ways to do chaining. The first one is forward chaining, second one is backwards chaining, and the third one is total task chaining. Forward, you go in order. So first you teach the first step, then the second step, then the third step, all the way to the last step. So for example, in washing hands, first you would teach turning on the faucet, then you would teach getting soap and you go on from there step by step from the beginning to the end. Backwards chaining is that you start teaching from the last step and then go to the first step. So it would be first teaching how to wipe your hands dry with a towel. Then the next step you choose is turning off the faucet because it's the second to last. And you keep going backwards until you reach the first step. And total task chaining is when you teach the whole task at once and you just prompt when they have difficulty with one of the steps. And that's it. You reach the end of the video. Here's your reward. Reinforcing enough? All right. So that's it for this part of skill acquisition. Next video, we're going to go over the end of skill acquisition. And um, yeah, I split it into two to not make it too long. But if you're finding this video is helpful at all, uh, drop a like down below so I know it's helping you out. Subscribe if you haven't done so already, and I'll catch you in the next one.